I was in trucking, it, it haven't figured it out yet. I grew up in the East Coast, I didn't grow up here. And if you haven't picked up on that, you go shortly once I get rolling. It just happens naturally. <clears throat> so I, I started in, uh, back in the early 70s. When I got out of college, got into transportation and logistics. Back then it was called trucking, today it's called supply chain. It's yeah, crazy yeah. how it changes, you know. <laughs> trucking isn't even a term anymore. <clears throat> but started back with working in Brooklyn and New Jersey and then in the transportation business. Worked for a company called Roadway Express. They transferred me out here to California in 1987. I came out here in 1987. They had a mess on their hands out here. We got it turned around. And after being here three years, they came to me and said, listen, we want to promote you. We're going to move you back to the corporate office. You've done a great job, and et cetera, et cetera. And giving me all this praise and accolades. And I sat there and said, no, thank you. <coughs> and looked at me and said, you'd be the youngest executive VP in the company. It's a billion dollar corporation. I said, yeah, you're right. The only problem is the corporate office is Akron, Ohio. <laughs> so I grew up in Jersey, a half hour from the beach. I'm living in California at the beach. Why would I want to spend the rest of my life in Ohio? So I made the change in life and left roadway after 15 years, went out on my own, started a trucking company with my partner. And then we built it up and we sold it back in uh, 19, or no, 2008. This is a great story too. We closed, sold it to a, a huge conglomerate that owned a steamship line called Zim Container Ships out of Haifa, Israel. We sold it to them, we closed. They wired the funds to us the third week in July. And in August that year is when the economy started oh, tanking. Okay. <laughs> when people say, wow, you know, well, how did you know? And I'm like, how did we know? We got lucky. <laughs> Nothing to do with it. Anything, we're not that smart guys. It was just the right time we had a target, we hit the target, we got out. So once I sold that, then I said, okay, now what am I going to do? I was going to teach at the graduate school level because I do a lot of, I still do a lot of lecturing at, at the graduate by MBA programs. And then I decided I saw an opportunity because I had the privilege of working for a billion dollar company and getting trained by a billion dollar company when I got out of college. Then I dropped down to an entrepreneurial company and we started. Basically, we took over a small company, it was about 12 million, we took it to about 175 million when we sold. And one of the things <clears throat> that saved me in that process was I knew what it should look like <clears throat> as it gets bigger. What happens with a lot of entrepreneurial companies, as you very well know, and Andy knows, um, you get in there and every time you grow, it's the biggest company you've ever run, you don't know what it should look like, so you don't understand process and procedures and how to get there. So I started working as a performance coach. <clears throat> I actually started working as a business advisor, and then it grew into a performance uh, coaching for executive teams. So now I <clears throat> pretty much work with executive teams and the, and the um, on performance, to increase their performance and, and coach them up on how to be better leaders, and how to do these things. The other thing I do, I do a lot of M&A work. <clears throat> uh, I work with companies to get them ready to sell. Usually I'll get pulled into it about a year ahead of time <clears throat> to position them to move drive the EBITDA, make the decisions because short term versus long term. I work very closely with one of your competitors, probably Brian Cave. I work for Brian Cave now for 10 years. I'm on a retainer with them. <clears throat> Working with their uh, senior partners, because no offense to the senior partners and lawyers, you're very good lawyers, you're terrible business people. <laughs> so I go in and teach them how to run their particular area and their attorneys and that, and work on that. And then <clears throat> that's where I pull in. If you do a lot of minute, you're familiar with Brett Sousa? Yeah, he does a lot of MA here in Orange County with Brian K, but Brett brings me in when they have a client who's going to sell. And they'll bring me in about 12 months ahead of time to start with that client to help them get ready, help them build the data room and do what they got to do so they understand it. Because as you know, what happens so many times when an entrepreneur sells this company, they get totally pulled into the selling of the company and nobody's running the company. <clears throat> and what happens if the deal doesn't go through and they turn around, the company they thought they had is no longer there because they took their focus off. So I come in and basically quarterback our whole process so they can continue to run the company. So that's my experience with Brian Cave. So I've been with those guys for quite a while. I work with the Irvine office and their Santa Monica office. It's cool. So that's how I got to where I am today. That's where I'm at. And then I started doing this and I do a lot of speaking and leadership training that kind of got squashed during COVID because of the travel and everything else. <clears throat> so now we're back traveling and starting to open up again. I have a client in Manhattan. I have clients in Springfield, Missouri. And the rest of my clients are based on the West Coast here. So that's my background. I met Andy through, um, well, the church, and then got working with Andy from the business level because 
He worked for a company that had two partners that started an engineering company uh, called RailPros right here in Irvine, and they started growing really rapidly. And I got in there working with the two owners again, putting processes in place to take them to the next level. And then <clears throat> those guys sold out and got out. Andy got stuck behind. And then Andy, <laughs> and, and Andy's moved on. So, and then I've been working together for a long time. <clears throat> so I've been to my, my topic today is everybody's, <clears throat> it's on everybody's mind right now is, you know, we're coming out of COVID. COVID, you know, I've been through a lot. We always have contingency planning, the what ifs. We never what if for COVID, <laughs> you know? We talked about earthquakes, we talked about the economy, yeah. the, the pandemic never came into play. And it's been very interesting watching what's happened during the pandemic and how working in the work environment today is coming out of this is gonna be completely different than it was when we went in. It's, it's a totally new, game we have to deal with it. It's, it's a new set of circumstances and at the same time we have the baby boomers who are phasing out of the work economy and more of the young people coming in. So we were with the challenge of how do we motivate these young 20 to 30, 35 year old people coming out of college and bringing them into the workforce and transitioning out the baby boomers and then on top of that challenge we get hit with the pandemic, right? So now as we come out of this, the biggest question we have and the problem that a lot of my clients have that we're working with is, okay, now as we slowly bring them back, it's different. What's different? Uh, a lot more remote, right? The five-day work week where everybody's in the office five days in a row is going to be a long time before that comes back. What we're seeing now is more and more companies are maybe going to a flexible week, four days in the office, a four-day work weekend. Uh, some of them are going, you can come and go as you please. Some jobs are required to be in the office, so the whole dynamics have changed now on um, what's happened here and the psychology of it, because I don't think we're gonna know the impact of COVID probably for at least 10 years from now, when we look back, because of the emotional drain that it's put on everybody. And people, it's very easy to say it didn't impact us, it impacted all of us in ways we probably don't <coughs> even realize. And that's what we have to deal with in the workplace, right? Because where do people spend the majority of their time? They spend it at the workplace. And that whole thing is changing. But because of this, McKinsey and companies have done some research and they predict that 25% of the workforce will need to change jobs. And the reason they'll need to change jobs is their jobs may have been eliminated. The jobs may have just shut down. And you have a lot of people, and I see this with my clients, where you have people, legacy people, who have been with somebody for 15 years, 20 years, doing the same thing. All of a sudden, they had 18 months working from home, laid off or whatever. So they're making career changes, especially in companies where their people travel a lot. The people who were, you know, lived in the airplane and traveled all the time, now they got home, and they got a taste of being home, being with their family, and they got used to that lifestyle. They don't want to go back in the air. We see a lot of people just making job changes, taking less money for the quality of life, which you didn't used to see. Everybody was going for the dollar, going for the dollar. Well, this has refocused everybody what they think and where they're at. The other thing <laughs> that we're seeing is what's what really the companies who were successful in working from home were the companies, and Andy paid me to put this in to get the plug, is the IT platform. Okay, the platform you run your company on today is more important than it's ever been because of the remote part of this. I have a client up in LA. Uh, they are a real estate uh, acquisition company. They own real estate, have about $2 billion worth of assets, all private money, it's a family office. And three years ago, I insisted that we put a one-year project together and that was when we came out of one of our strategy meetings to go paperless because in that business there was paper everywhere, okay? And we did it, okay? We took about nine months and they got 95% paperless. And they tell me all the time, the only reason they got through COVID, because they had to work remotely, is because they were paperless. They wouldn't have survived if they didn't have the platform and we didn't insist <coughs> on going paperless because everything was stacks and stacks of papers going back and forth. So that's, that's where the workplace starts to change. So the companies are gonna come out of this are really reevaluating their platform and how can they set up a platform that A, is secure, and B, you can have people working remotely from anywhere in the world and have they access. The other thing that's coming into play and is growing bigger and bigger, as you know, is your virtual meetings. Okay, you, you know, obviously Zoom took off, and now you got Team, you got a lot of other ones, and you have it no different than if you look at your 
trade shows and things like this in Vegas where they used to get eight to 10,000 people. Now they'll probably have four to 5,000, but they'll have another five to 8,000 people dialing them remotely from around the world. So the whole technology part of the play is, is really probably pushed the technology ahead five or six years in the marketplace where without COVID, that would, it would have taken a longer runway to get there compared to where we are now. So the virtual meetings are there. But when we start to look at this and we start to think about, you know, <coughs> employees and it's one of these things we take for granted but we have to understand that not only were they impacted at work they were impacted at home when you go back over this if any of you have to have kids in school the the juggling act of trying to have your kids homeschool and do virtual learning at the same time you're trying to work from home and everything else the pressure on the family and what it's done and the psychological impact of that that's going to hang on it's going to carry forward, and I'm sure you've seen it. I'm sure you see some people handle it better than others. Some people have bounced back pretty quickly, but there's always that underlying trauma that everybody experienced that has to be dealt with, and people have to deal with it move forward to really let it go. So where does where the workplace come in? The workplace comes in from an executive team and from a leadership standpoint is how now do we manage these people as they slowly work back into the workplace, they come back to work, they're back at their desks. What are their needs, right? Well, what do they need? And that's the key we have to look at is to bring these people back and then what do they need. <laughs> so the research has been done and what you got to be aware of is the, the mental health of the workforce is going to be completely different. And what the workforce and what the mental health has been based on is hope, right? Because we went through 18 months of this, and what kept people going, especially in the workplace and things, was hope. We're hoping this is going to happen. We're hoping this is going to happen. And as people started to hope things were going to happen, well, what happened is we go backwards. We come out of the first string. We think we're getting better. Businesses are opening, and boom, we get hit again. There's the hope went away. Now we have the hope coming back. And now these people are hanging on hope. So what we have to do from a leadership standpoint is continue to reinforce the hope that no matter what happens, and we're going to have bumps in the road here, things are going to happen, we're going to be okay. People want that reassurance that we're going to be okay, that we're going to get through this, and we're going to work as a team, and we'll continue to go through this, right? And what happens is the employees now, because of what they went through, like I said, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on work-life balance and quality of life, more so than we've ever seen before. You hear about those trends, and people start to go quality of life. I chose quality of life back in 1990. I chose to live in Newport Beach versus Akron, Ohio. That was a quality of life decision for me back then. We're going to see more and more of that, where people are choosing the quality of life and the hours. That's why they think the four-day work week, the three days at home, or working in the office two days at home is going to be the new norm, because that's what's going to drive you. Why is that important? To know this to attract good talent, you're going to have to understand what drives a talent and what they're looking for when they come for a job. It's not about the base salary anymore. It's not about the money as much as the quality of life. The other issue that's coming into play in this is what we call workplace safety. The, the, the workforce now is much more attuned and they want to know social distancing. What is your COVID pro, uh, policy within the company? <coughs> what we see going on more and more and more and more companies now or when the beginning they weren't, if you're not vaccinated, you can't come into the office. Um, I have a client that made the mandate and if people don't get vaccinated by October 15th, they basically they're out of a job because of what they do, they have to be in the office. So we're seeing this come into the workplace too. So there's gonna be a lot more questions on this. Not so much in California because we have a high rate. It's more of an issue when I deal with my people in Missouri and some of the, uh, my clients back in New York, especially in, in Missouri because you have a lot of people in that state that have not been vaccinated and they've drawn a line in the sand. So it's going to be challenges there to see what happens and where that goes from. But the workplace safety is going to be a concern. What else goes into workplace safety? Your policy, how close are your cubicles? Okay, what's the social distancing? Because that's in everybody's head is keep down social distancing and things like this. So that's going to be something you need to be aware of as you start moving forward. To have that ongoing COVID policy, if you haven't put together, memorialize it. Put something together and memorialize it because you're going to be questioned on that when you start to hire people. They're going to be asking those questions. Not everybody, but the majority are going to be asking. These are the questions that are on people's mind when they've done the research, what concerns them about the workplace. So we're going to have to get into that. The other thing you got to look at 
from an ownership standpoint, the leadership standpoint is it's absolutely going to impact the cost of health care. Health care is going through the roof, as we know, to begin with, right? So we're going to be in a situation where health care costs are going to go up. We know that. We don't know how much they're going to go up, but we know it's going to go up because just of the, the amount of money that the uh, medical, uh, the insurance companies have had to lay out over the last 18 months for the cost of COVID. Uh, we're going to end up paying for that and it's going to come back in your return. So as expensive as health care is today, and when you start to put your budgets together and you look at what you provide your employees, that's going to be another big challenge because that cost is going to continue to rise. And it's going to, we thought it escalated quickly the last four or five years. There's some people who projected that's going to look like nothing compared to what's going to happen going forward. And the amount of coverage and the types of coverages will change, the amount of deductibles will change. And that's going to be another thing that as an employer we have to look at and we have to deal with. So that's going to be another challenge that you want on your radar. You're starting to see a little bit of it now, but you're going to see a lot more of it as we move forward. Okay, as, as, as the insurance companies really look at their hit and what's happened and what they're going to do there. So these are just things to be aware of that's going to happen in the workplace now. The next thing we want to talk about is go through, okay, how do we handle that, okay? How do we support our employees? What do we do differently than we've done in the past? In the past, we have our, our things that we do with employees to motivate them, keep them set up. It's going to be even more important now. The thing you have to understand now is what motivated them before may not motivate them today like it did in the past. And things we may not get into in the past, we're going to have to get more into with our employees going forward. So what do we mean by that? You know, The first thing is, the research tells us is that the people coming back, one of the key things they want is appreciation. They want to be recognized. They want to be appreciated. We've always said that, okay, what do they want? Money only lasts 18 days and you give somebody a raise, et cetera. It's all about the appreciation factor here. They want to be appreciated. They want to know that they're part of a team and they're appreciated for what they're doing because in their mind, they've sacrificed a lot over the last 12 to 18 months. They've been working from home, balancing work, getting the kids off to school. They want to know that that was noticed and appreciated. That's one of the first things that shows up. The other thing you need to do, if you're not doing these now, it's more important, is what we call the individual appraisals, what I call one-to-ones. Uh, what's a one-to-one? -one? You take your employees and as an executive team, individually, you meet with the employees one-to-one. -one. And it's more to start those meetings. It isn't so much business focus as how are you doing? How is your family doing? How are the kids? Okay, so you get to personalize that experience and get to know the employee and what drives that employee. Because if they're having issues at home, that maybe we can help them with it, they're gonna make them a better employee. But if they're having issues at home, that's gonna carry over to the workplace and the challenge is there. So you're gonna have to have more flexibility somewhat too, especially if they go back into virtual learning and stuff to flexible hours so they can get kids to school and same things like this because that's a challenge my daughter has. Two young ones, one is two and a half, the other one's about four months. <laughs> She's an attorney, her husband is, works for an IT company and it was a challenge. They ended up putting both of them in daycare just so they could work from home because it's hard to manage both. Okay, well, economically, they were in a position to do it. A lot of people were not economically in that position to do it, so they had to struggle. So the one-to-ones when people start to come back and come into the office is important. If you don't have a set schedule for your people and it's all your people, don't assume because somebody's at a certain level they don't need that one-to-one -one and that the same appreciation as somebody who may not be at that same level. So, from, you know, my job is I do the one-to-ones of my CEOs on a regular basis and get them, well, how are you feeling? What's going on? What's going on in your mind? What, what scares you? What, what, you know, what are you worried about? Where's that hope going? So that's where we have to get into that individual support and do it. The other thing you want to do is we start to get into this and people come back is as soon as people start to come back in the office, get them more involved in what goes on day to day. We don't lean on our employees enough, right? They, they're, they're a lot of smart people, they have good ideas. You wanna incorporate them into the process so they feel like we're part of a team. Because again, what did I say before? They're looking for the hope, right? Well, the more we involve them, the more we get them engaged in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, the more hope they're going to have because they start feeling good about themselves, they start feeling like they're bringing value so we help their self-esteem by getting them involved. How do we do that? Maybe more committees, we give them a task and say, hey Andy, this is an issue we have. So grab four or five people, let's go figure this out. Where before we may dictate, or may only use the same people all the time, right? And not use these people and get them engaged. 
The other thing we have to be careful of is it's human nature. It, we may favor some people within the organization over other people in the organization, right? And that's going to be a bigger gap now if we do that. It's really going to stand out. Remember, these people need hope, they need appreciation, they need to be part of the decision making. So make sure we're treating everybody equally. That's going to be the key, is to treat everybody equally. Don't lean on your same people that you lean on all the time. Get more people involved, because that involvement, when you pull them in, is what's going to drive them. That involvement, when they're part of that decision-making process, makes them feel needed and makes them feel appreciated. And what's the other benefit of getting more people involved in the decision? More ideas. More ideas on what else? I am. What's that? Buy-in. Buy-in, exactly. <laughs> okay, the pride of ownership, they're going to buy in. I tell my executive teams all the time when I coach these guys on performance, I said, don't make the decisions. You know what you want. You can get a group together and they can come up with a solution. But it's so much easier if it's their solution and not yours because now there's a pride of ownership there. Because as soon as you make the decision, what happens? If it doesn't work, whose fault is it? Well, you told me this is what you want it done. So that's what we have to stay away from it. These types of things, as people circle back into the workplace and we want to build up that morale and get things going, are going to be critical. Okay, That's what's going to happen when they come back. The other thing we want to do is we want to look for additional responsibilities to give people because it keeps them busy and it's a new challenge. If they come back into the same rut, they start to get down, they start to maybe not to be as productive. So if we can find new challenges for them, put them in some decision making, not high level, but things where you just say, hey, you know, what do you think? Run with it. So we want to engage our employees more as they come back. That's really what, at the end of the day, we want to get them more engaged than we ever had before. And because the engagement process is going to help them deal with the hope and the trauma that everybody has for the past 18, 19 months of what we've gone through. Because people are still living on the edge. Yeah, it's getting better. You can go out to dinner now. We can do these. But everybody's worried about that next one coming behind them. What's going to happen? Are we going to get shut down again? What's going to happen? So we have to be real and understand that fear as we work with these people to bring them back. Because again, we want to integrate them back into the workforce. That's going to be the key. The other thing we got to do that you know a lot of companies did before, it's going to be even more important now. You got to have fun, right? We got to build fun and we got to do things. If it's an after work happy hour, all right? If, if it's crazy things like Wednesdays, you know, uh, breakfast meetings or bring breakfast and burritos for everybody in the office and just sit around and talk about what we're doing this weekend, get it away, but get that bonding because we've lost that. That's one of the things the research has said is there's so much interaction that happens face to face that you don't get on the virtual. All right? And people are, a lot of people, virtual is going to continue, but they're tired of virtual. They want to get back to the office. It's people that, you know, I, I talked to, they could, hey, man, I wish I could work from home two or three days a week. Well, now they've done it for 18 months. Now they can't wait to get back to the office because they missed the social interaction. So we have to think about that and we have to set up situations to put them in social interaction type places where we can, we can do things that build the bond back, build that team <coughs> back. And it doesn't have to be anything that costs a lot of money. A lot of it's just fun stuff. All right, one of those things. I had one of my clients the other day. Remember, I don't know if you ever played that. We used to play it when I was like in second or third grade, <laughs> way back when, where you sit on your desk and you throw the ball to each other. And if you drop it, you got to sit in your chair. They broke that game out. <laughs> OK, so I got this big office and this ball is flying all around the office. <laughs> and if you drop it, boom. OK, and they, and they said it went really well. They're, they're, the person who runs their HR has all these creative ideas on these little silly games, but it brings that bond back together, right? And the teamwork and everything back, because that's what people miss the most about working from home during the past 18 months, especially if you go back and look at the first six months where you couldn't go anywhere. There was nothing. You were basically on lockdown. And then slowly it opened up again. And again, what are people hanging on? I talked about we're hanging on hope. We're hoping it gets better. We're hoping it changes. So whatever we can do to reinforce that hope that they have, so they continue to have that hope, that's what keeps them positive. As soon as they lose hope and they don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, then we have a problem in the workforce because they start to go backwards, right? So that, that's where the challenges come in as we come out of this. And it's going to change. And again, we're not going to know the full impact for another eight to 10 years on what it's really done to the economy, what it's really done to the workplace. Because everybody has new challenges we've never had before. You know, we have the challenges right now of Nobody wants to work. We have all these people who are afraid to come back into the workplace. So we have all these job openings and it's crushing the economy. I don't know how many people here get over to the beach, but last weekend there was 104 steamship lines sitting off the coast of California. 
There was 82 of here, and the rest were up in the Bay Area. The West Coast ports are at a standstill. It's putting companies out of business. Anybody who imports has no product, right? Because people don't want to go back to work. They don't have enough drivers to pull them out. The guys left the port jobs, took their leave of absence because they didn't want to be the COVID and everything else, and now they can't get them back to work. I mean, that impact is being dealt with nationwide. But the port here, if you ever get over and see it, if you've been over by the beach, I've never seen it in all my years of the supply chain. I've never seen the backup. Even when the Teamsters went on strike, the Marshall went on strike, it's not as bad as it is right now. So these are the things that we're dealing with from an employee standpoint, is trying to get employees to come back to work and back to the workplace. So what's it doing? It's driving up the cost of labor, okay, which is going to be passed on. It's going to be an inflation thing. But you don't want to lose your current people. So it's almost not that you know they, they know it, but if you have good people, you got to do anything you can to hang on to them. And it's not just about money. Again, it goes back to the safety of the workplace. Is it fun? Are we doing things? Do I see a future here? What's here for the company? Engage them in these things. Engage them in the decision-making process. Engage them in teams that to empower them to make decisions and do things. That's what's going to keep your employees working here versus going someplace else. Because the competition and other people out there are poaching from each other and just driving the price up to throw money at people like crazy. Everybody I talk to, all my clients, their biggest fear is the competition is trying to buy their people away. So how do we keep them? We can't just keep throwing money at them because that throws off your whole business model. The other thing is the other guy just throws more money at them, right? So it's, it's, a, you know, it's like a Walmart. You can never be the cheapest for long because somebody else is going to come in cheaper. It's the same thing here. So you have to look at these other things. We talked about the safety, the platform, how you engage them, how you make them feel part of the team, how you go back to having fun again so they like the work environment they're in and they see hope. That's how you hang on to them because it's, it's brutal out there. I don't know if anybody in here has experienced that right now with their employees, but it's, it's brutal with what's going on out there. So that's the things we have to work on. So that being said, I gave you stuff to think about. Let's just have an open conversation for a while. What do you see? What do you see in your workplace? What do you see from a workman's comp? Because I'm heavily involved in workman's comp. Because one of my clients is a staffing company. And they got 5,000 people on a payroll every day all over Southern California and Texas. And workman's comp is huge. But our biggest fear is, is these people who have been out on unemployment now are coming back because the unemployment's going. I got used to staying home. Our fear is we're going to see you jumping on employment claims because they're going to come back to work. They're going to get a soft tissue injury. They're going to go back out so they can go back out and collect disability and have to work. So I don't know what you're seeing, but that's that's the staffing industry as a whole. When I sit on some of the Zoom calls and we try to strategize how to beat it, that's their biggest fear is what it's going to do to the workman's comp. So there's a byproduct of all this we got to deal with too looking forward. Go ahead. We've had a little decline, and then a lot of we've taken a lot of COVID cases where people have caught COVID, yeah. brought it home, um, caught some, you know, what their coworker, excuse me, caught it from a coworker, brought it home, caught somebody in the family, and the family member died. Um, I mean, pretty much anything you can hear of, we've, we've, that you guys have heard, we've, we've been handling cases like that, but uh, we we didn't skip a beat. I mean, we've continued to keep all of our staff. Um, working. We own the building, so we have two floors, and uh, we just spread out people in the office. But um, but it's kind of dipped down a little bit recently within like the last couple of months. But um, I think it's always six to eight months behind, right? Because like people go back to work and then they start, you know, having that specific injury or cumulative injury like over over time. But in a Overview of overlooking, um, we haven't skipped a beat. We haven't slowed down much at all as far as the number of cases we've taken. We take probably 50% of the cases that we talk to. Um, some of them either don't need our services, you know, able to manage it on their own, or um, we just don't want their case. Yep. So, but bad case, um, huh? Bad case, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's rare, but most of them are just, we're able to give them advice to be able to handle it on, on their own. And, uh, you know, 85, probably 90% of our clients are union, are Teamsters, or we don't do longshoremen because that's, an, that's another different law, they have a different law, uh, law but, um, or federal employees, they fall under a different law. But um, 
lot of the cases we're taking are like long term, so it's like cumulative. Like yeah. 30 years I've been doing the same thing, right. carpal tunnel issues, trigger fingers for my Yahtzee guys, shooting film, stuff like that, because they're now going back to work where they were out for a long, for a good period. Um, but, uh, but all in all, I mean, at least our firm, some of the other firms have, have declined. There was one of our main competitors in LA, had significant, they're down 25%, 30% from the number of cases that they were getting before. Do you think there's going to be an increase in workman's comp claims, though, because people are going to go back to work, they've been out of work, they're out of shape, or they're just, mm -hmm. they're yeah. kind of like, I'm going to go for a workman's comp, my back hurts, and I want to stay home a little bit longer, I'm not ready to go back yet. Yeah, absolutely. That's or we, we've even taken cases, uh, I mean, somebody's working from home. Yeah. After work from home, they bring some work files home and they trip over them or something, yeah. or they don't have the ergonomic work desk work that they're at, they're at a kitchen table that they're working from. Well, so um, I can see some of those yeah. arising, especially since a lot, you know, people will be working from home more, you know, and yeah. being, you know, not having the same type of uh, desk configuration. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely changed uh, the type of claims that we'll we'll see yes, and some different things. I've got a question, or maybe stuff that you've studied or seen, but I've been thinking about the. There seems there's obviously either a short term or it's going to turn into a long term increase in wages on the lower side. I mean, right? You hear about yeah. McDonald's paying people now, whatever you know, eighteen fifty an hour or whatever, right? What I mean, what 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 happens with that down down the road? Because you know, obviously they had, they had to raise all their workforce to that level, mm -hmm. right? And now in another whatever year, or whatever, where we don't have the, the, the shortage or two years where we don't experience the same shortage of people that we have right now in the workplace. I don't know how they back that down and get back to the old levels. It will happen because what's going to happen. Is that what happens? Yeah, because what happens is it readjusts itself. And unfortunately or unfortunately, what's going to take is probably a recession. Okay, mm -hmm. And we're going to head into a recession, right? Because inflation is starting to skyrocket. But mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's coming. Right? Mm -hmm. Inflation is going to be there. The recession we're going to hit is going to be tricky one because if you look at what does the Fed do, what, what's our out there in the recession? Yeah. What's the first thing we lower interest rates? <laughs> well, if we lower interest rates, now we're going to be negative interest. Europe yeah. tried that back in 08 and 09 and see how well it worked. Okay, yeah. I think backfired. Okay. So it's going to adjust itself. It's always, it always adjusts itself, right? Supply side, supply and demand. So as people start to slow down, they leave people off, they'll start to bring people back in at a lesser, lesser, rate. lesser impact. It's, it's so crazy on how hard it is. I was up in Big Sky, Montana, two weeks ago, right? And I flew into Bozeman, and I spent one night in Bozeman waiting for my son to come down from Montana, and then we headed up to the mountains, right? There's a Walmart. And this is Montana. The minimum wage in Montana is like $8. Walmart, twenty-two fifty to start. Wow. Okay, that's what that, and that was Montana. The other thing that's driving those prices up, especially at that warehouse level and the entry level positions, Amazon's I'm crushing sorry, yeah. it. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, give you an example from the, the supply chain. Amazon right now is recruiting forklift drivers in the warehouse and paying them twenty five to twenty seven dollars an hour to drive a forklift. Uh -huh. Okay, you used to get drivers for twenty bucks an hour. Drivers now are forty five, fifty bucks an hour to get a driver. So, but that will adjust. The economy's been through this before. Mm -hmm. It's just going to take the recession, a downturn in the economy, put people out of work. Then they put jobs come back. They'll bring them in a lower level. That's happened in 08 and 09. You had people in back in 08 and 09 made a lot of money. They got laid off. They came back in. They couldn't match that. So it will adjust itself. In the meantime, everybody's passing it on, right? <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, if you look at prices right now, produce is going to skyrocket right now. So get ready because the California growing season's over. The Texas growing season is coming to an end, so it's all going back to being imported, right? So now what happens on the ocean is they can't bring it into California because California is backed up. So all the produce that would normally come out of uh, Argentina, New Zealand, Australia, instead of coming into the ports on the West Coast for West Coast distribution, they're going into the East Coast and trucking them back. And I, your containers, because of the imbalance out here, you can get a container from China, a product for $3,800 for a container from China to Port of LA. That same container today is nine to ten thousand dollars. So it's all going to be built back into the pricing. That's why if you're watching prices in the grocery store, forget gas. You 
look at the grocery store, the prices in the grocery store are through the roof. If you go out to dinner, you see what you're paying now compared. That will eventually adjust itself, but right now that's the inflation that they're not really talking about. They're just starting to, that's going to hit, that's going to drive the economy back down. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend for, so for, for us, you know, most, most of our employees are, are professional level people. Right. And so, you know, we definitely are seeing the, the wage pressures. Would you, would you suggest maybe it's done through something more like bonuses or more temporary? I was going to say, I would tie them into a variable model. Right? Okay. Because once I raise their base, I'm in a yeah. fixed cost. Now with the fixed yeah. cost and the economy goes down, I'm stuck with a high fixed. Mm -hmm. So my business model has always been, I'm going to go as variable as I can. So when I bring those guys in, I'm going to bring them in. And what I like to do is put together, and I can, we can talk offline about this, is put together a program for them where they're participating in the profits of the company mm -hmm. with, with their yearly cash out. Mm -hmm. right? Or there's some long-term things you can do to protect my taxes, depending on what they're Hey, if, if it's a guy making 150, 200,000, then we start to look at programs where we can go tax free for now and they can put it in pay tax when they pull it out. There's a lot of ways to do that. If they're under 150, under 100 grand, they want the cash now because they need it. You know, hey, it sounds crazy, but yeah, $100,000 lifestyle in Southern California and Orange County, you're on the low end, right? So that's why we looked at the cash amount and we tie it into the profitability of the company and we tie it into the profitability of the team so they're all working together for the same goal. Okay, it used to be KPI, I'm going to reward you for what you do individually. That breaks down teamwork. So now what we want to do is we want to create incentive programs to get everybody working as a team, going back to what I said earlier, get them involved in the decision-making process, get them involved working together to solve the solutions and build the teamwork within the organization. Because that's what your high-power companies moving forward are going to look like. It's going to be a lot of collaboration between teams. You know, if you go back, like when I went to college, I don't know, I'm 68, so I was in college way back in the 70s. It was all individual work, individual work. You go now, like when I lecture in the MBA classes, it's all teams. Okay, they, they get graded as a team, and they work on things as a team. It's a collaboration. Well, that's followed into the workplace. That's what's had to change how we compensate. Okay, pay for performance into more of a team concept than an individual concept. But we can talk about that. There's a lot of ideas there. Once you might understand better. Yeah. What are what's anybody else seeing? What are you seeing on the law side of this? A couple of lawyers here. What do you see from the legal side, <laughs> especially on the M&A? There's a lot of M&A going on right now. <laughs> it's keeping me busy. More yeah. tax, <clears throat> tax driven, and yep. fear of um, capital gains rates. And Absolutely. Happening with Biden's plans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what's driving everybody right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of people rushing to close deals before the end of the year. Before the end of the year. How about from a pure employee standpoint, a morale standpoint, what do you see from your employees that are coming back to work? What are their concerns? Have their behavior changed? If you're bringing them back, are they coming back full time? Is it fractional in the office? Do they have choices? What do you see? And everybody here is working in a different type of environment. What do you see now? Or where are you at? Now? With our company, it's kind of mixed. I mean, there's some that couldn't wait for us to you know, unlock the doors and bring in. There's other groups that we're, you know, we're struggling to get them, you know, coming back into the office. I mean, even just you know, a couple days a week, because um, there is that power of <clears throat> that energy that comes together when people are, you know, in a room that you just don't. You're just never going to get on a Zoom. You're not going to have those, I'll call them, water cooler conversations right. type things where you, you know, you have that that bond. When you're on Zoom, it's more of, you know, business and get done. I mean, right. and so forth. Um, so it's it's not it's not going to be one size fits all, you know. Like our accounting team, they, they couldn't wait to get back in the office. I mean, they were you know squatting in certain spots before you know, we were really ready for them. Um, and other groups really like that work-life balance of working from home. I mean, there's I mean, for me, for example, taking the kids to school, picking the kids up from work, or from picking them up uh, from school, their work. Um, you know, I've never been able to do that before in my career. Yeah. Because I'm always, but now I can do it. Like, oh, two thirty, cool. I don't have a call. Let's go grab the kids and spend that extra few minutes time with. Them. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. To be able to do that. Anybody else? It's interesting. Uh, one or two people in an office that say twenty-five or thirty we have coming and going in our office uh, that are ticked off that they have to come in. 
are you going to make everybody's life miserable? Miserable, yeah. So everybody has to wear a mask now if they leave their office. If, if you have an individual office or your cube, you have to wear a mask. And so, you know, there's a little bit of dissension in yeah. the, in the, that, you, that you can feel in the air. Like, you know, no one wants to talk about it. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's tricky because as an employer, you have to be careful because you don't want anybody to sue you. Yeah, <laughs> you know? no. And, uh, and you have to abide by it, and everyone's trying to just be polite, but, you know, it's that elephant in the room that you don't yeah. want to address. And, you know, the best way to deal with that is when you have your meetings and you have your group meetings, just reinforce the State of California Workman's Comp Guidelines for coming back to work in the office. Because what happens is I had some clients who were trying to explain, I said, well, why are you trying to justify this? Stand behind the law. You don't have a choice. It's very clearly written with the state on employ or um, workman's comp. It's written very clearly to come back into the office. This is what you need to do. Now it's out of you. It's not your decision. It's mandated by the state. And that helps. So those people who are upset, I get it, but it's mandated by the state. We have no control as the employer. I can't make exceptions here. And that's what, because everybody was going through that in the beginning. Now it's the more they educate the employees that this isn't our decision. This is mandated by the state. This is what we have to do. It gives us validity and it gets you off the hook. So I don't know if you've done that yet, but when you have your meetings, have HR, explain it, read it to them. Because if you give it to them, they're not going to read it, right? But if we sit down and we go through it in the meeting, say, listen, just to get this out there, this is not our choice, but this is what is we have to do to open up and bring people back into the office. And oh, by the way, it's working, especially in the state of California. If you looked yesterday, okay, Take politics aside, everybody, you know, politics has ruined everything, got involved in it. We have the lowest rate in the country right now. And we have the highest number of people eligible to be vaccinated who have been vaccinated. And the statistics are proving it. And that came out again yesterday, and they've been dropping, dropping, and dropping. So it's working, okay? The things that they've done in the state of California are working compared to states that haven't taken the stronger approach. So you can't argue with the numbers. You can argue with the politics, you can argue with everything else you want to argue with, you can't argue with the numbers. And again, these are the guidelines put out by the state of California Department of Labor. This is what you got to do if you want to come back to work. So that's what I would do. I would educate them. This isn't our choice. Because right now, if, you know, you can't take for granted that they understand that, right? That's where we get in trouble. Don't assume that they understand it's not your decision, it's the state. I'm going to re-educate them and let them know that this is the mandate we're under to bring people back in. And if they're uncomfortable, then you have the option to work from home. So, anything else? Again, the, the important thing is, is that people come back, engage with them from a leadership standpoint, so do the one-to-ones with them, but very important. Even there without COVID, one-to-ones are always good. Let the people know you care, see what's on their mind. Don't make it about business, make it about personal first. How's your family doing? How are the kids doing back in school? Things like this, just to come about and good. Again, they're looking for hope, right? They need that reassurance that things are going to be okay. Right? If you go back, if you study psychology, you know, we talk about the attachment theory. Right? And the attachment theory started with children. Now the attachment theory in adults has become a big thing. And the more research you do on the attachment theory, that's what I say is going on right now in the workforce. Okay? That disattachment is what's crushing people. So what there's going to be coming out. I was having a conversation with somebody. I pick their brain all the time. And, um, and the human aspect of this. There's going to be attachment theory down the road for the workplace and what's happened here because there's been a disattachment. And that's the uncertainty that people have. You hear about, you know, the, the, the child who's been disattached from the mother or whoever. Now, with adults, it's absolutely what's going on in the workplace right now. That's where the one to ones and the meetings and getting them involved, making them feel that they're attached and they're part of it and they'll identify their own type of attachment they need. Right, because there's usually three or four different types of attachment that we've identified. That's what you got to work on. It's the psychology of bringing them back and getting the most out of them. Good. Anything else? If not, Andy, thank you. Thank you, guys.